Christ, in love, redeemed us, all of us, for his own. What good news. 
It's news that's being proclaimed by God's people worldwide, and we join them in singing to God, in praying to God, and in listening to his word faithfully read and faithfully preached. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice together and be glad in it. We begin our worship this morning by offering our voices in God in praise by singing hymn number two, Come Thou Almighty King. Join me. Let's sing together. Be seated, please, but keep those hymnals open and turn to 282, 282, as we continue in an attitude of praise, singing glorious things of thee are spoken. Join me, let's sing.
amazing people, good morning and welcome to worship. I don't know about you, but I'm always excited because I get to see smiling faces back at me. It's the highlight of my week. I hope it is the highlight of each of yours. And to our wonderful people who are worshiping and connecting with us online, please understand we are so excited that you have connected with us as well. If by chance you are in this building and your face is in the place, I'm going to ask if you are a visitor, if you would, look in the pew back there. There's going to be a connect card there. I promise, I promise, we won't call you like some bill collectors do. But we will literally call you just to see how we can connect with you and how you can connect with us. You can drop that great card in the offering receptacle that is located at various places in our building. And guess what? If you can't find an offering receptacle, you can just flat out come to one of us and say, here, here is my card. But I want each of you all to know whether you are a visitor or you're a fifth time member, a first time member, we are so, so glad that you are here. And with all of that said, understanding that this indeed is the day that the Lord has made, friends, let's continue in worship by praying together. Gracious God and loving God, thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you that we are just able to assemble today just to lift you higher and give you praise. We thank you so much for Jesus, and we just pray that every offering that we do, everything we say, everything we sing, the word that is preached, may we be found faithful today, and may we worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Good morning, and a special good morning to our kids here in the sanctuary and at home. I am so glad that you guys are here worshiping with us today. And so I have a question for you. Have you ever heard of something called a phoenix? Right, I know some of you have. So a phoenix is this mythical bird. And by mythical, I mean it doesn't actually exist, but it's a part of Greek folklore. So these stories that are handed down from generation to generation, and a phoenix is a character in Greek folklore. And so there's a bird in the Bible that is a little similar to a phoenix that means something about new life and renewal. And if you're thinking of a dove, then your head is in the same place as mine. And so just like the dove was a sign of peace and new life for Noah and his family, a phoenix does new life in a different kind of way. So the story of the phoenix goes, when it's ready to die, it will actually catch on fire, like this internal combustion, and it will burn into this pile of ashes. And these ashes are so important because out of those ashes, a new phoenix is born. And so that's crazy, right? But there are actually things in your life that work a lot like a phoenix. And I don't mean that things just catch on fire, that, that would be scary, but sometimes there are things in our life where the old turns into something new. So if you have ever lost a tooth, I wanna see a really big smile under your masks. So your old tooth was pushed out to make room for these grown-up teeth that are stronger. And how about when we outgrow our clothing? Do we keep wearing the same clothes even though they don't fit? No, that would be silly. We shed our clothing, kind of like an animal would, and we get new clothing that fits our bodies. Now sometimes renewal and relife, or new life is not easy and it's not always as fun as going shopping or getting a visit from the tooth fairy because sometimes the old thing that we lost was really important to us. Has anyone ever broken a bone or scraped your knee? I know that I have, definitely, and that healing process is not fun. And even when you're done healing, 
the tissue and the fibers in your body are never going to be exactly the same. And this morning, Pastor Doc is going to be talking about the destruction of the temple. The temple was something that the people loved so much. And it's hard for them to regrow after that loss. But I want you to think about the things in your life that go in circles. And when we lose something and we gain something. And look at the things in your life that will never be the same. That's not always easy to do. Just like the phoenix that has to burn in order to find new life. But remember that God's work is done in the ashes. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the old things that we love and the new things that are here to change us. I thank you for good spirits and good hearts that work together in your service to make things new. Amen.
Our scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will this be and what will be the sign that all these things are about to happen and to be accomplished. Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. Good morning. I've been asked to lead the newly formed Mission Council. The goal of this Mission Council is to combine partnerships and hands-on service. We aim to offer hope and model love through the deep and long-term connections to local and global mission organizations. Part of our new vision statement is sharing God's love in the world. It will take all of us to find our passion and come forward to help accomplish this goal. And Second Ponce has a variety of ways that we can do that. From reading at Garden Hills Elementary School right behind us, to getting involved with the Miami mission trip, to praying for Janae Angel, helping with the Easter egg hunt and trunk or treat. All of this involves missions and people with a passion to help. I have personally cooked hot dogs for the Garden Hills Fall Festival, and I've been to Miami five times. Watching young faces that are eager to learn about God's love is very rewarding to me. A portion of every tithe and offering goes to the mission budget to help support all of these activities and more. Feel free to reach out to myself or the team and to plug in wherever you can. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we give you our praise as we give you our tithes and offerings. May the money that is collected be used for the ministry of this church to nurture us spiritually. May it use, be used to serve, support missions in the places of the world where people have little chance to hear your gospel. May it be used in our local community for those who need a helping hand. Bless the ministries of these offering support. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together, friends. Gracious and loving God, you do bring beauty from ashes. And Lord, we come today acknowledging, oh God, how much we need you. Lord, we need you. We need you every hour, every moment, every second. Lord, we need you. We trust you. Lord, we know that many are struggling at this time in various ways with sickness, and we ask you to be with them, comforting. Lord, we know that many are discouraged, and we ask you, O Lord, to bring encouragement. Dear God, we acknowledge that there's a mixture of grief and doubt and loss, but you, oh God, you bring resurrection and new life. And Lord, we trust you. We trust you to lead us onward as your people. For we know, Lord, even in the ashes, you can bring new life. Gracious God, we know that you and you alone can do these things. Work in us, Lord, and through us, Lord, so that we may be your people who testify in the world to your great love. Lord, we need you. And we know that you don't need us, but yet you want to use us anyway. Help us, Lord, to work together as the body of Christ to show and share your love faithfully in the world. Lord, above all, today we want to thank you for, for Jesus. We want to thank you for his great love for each of us to scatter our sins as far as the east is from the west. Lord Jesus is who we treasure. And we thank you, Lord, for him. And it's in his name that we ask all these prayers today. Amen. The Bible says, while we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, Christ gave himself for us. It's a great truth. It's a great truth of God's word. Let's be reminded of that truth as we offer our voices together as we prepare to hear God's word. Join me, remaining seated as we sing, What Wondrous Love Is This?
For those who weren't here last week, I got up here to preach and one page of my sermon was gone. I found out later who the culprit was. Bill was cleaning up, tidying up a little, put it under here, and I had to wing it for five minutes. But today we have all of it here for our hearing. You heard Miss Allie say that we're looking at the temple destruction, Solomon's temple being destroyed. Now use your imagination, this will take a little bit of a stretch, but if you can imagine a regional national catastrophe that disrupted everything, put everybody in a spin, when folks thought everything was nailed down and all of a sudden everything is coming unraveled and it left people hopeless. If none of that sounds familiar, just use your imagination. Here's their story. Back in the wilderness wanderings, you remember, the Hebrew people followed the Holy Ark of the Covenant, that uh, chest symbol of God's presence, which was carried ahead of the nomad people as they wandered through the wilderness, and they followed the Ark to show the way to the Promised Land. Then when they settled in the Promised Land, after crossing the Jordan, the ark made its way uh, to several different communities. It moved around for a while. It'd be in this city for a little while. It'd go to that uh, sanctuary for a little while, kind of like a traveling art exhibit. This community could have it a little while. Well, then David captures Jerusalem. And we've got a new king and a new reign, and David decides that the, that the symbol of God's presence, the Ark of the Covenant, needs a new home as well. He's going to bring it and establish this new home for the Ark near the palace. David chooses a site for the future temple, Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. It's the highest point in all of Jerusalem. David meets with the architects, plans, groundbreaking, but the temple was not completed until about 967 BC. It wasn't completed until 57 years after David first took the throne. The temple was built as the home for the ark, but it also had a place around it, an assembly place for the people of God to come and mill around. So the temple itself wasn't all that huge, but the courtyard with the gathering place and all left plenty of room for folks to mill about. Five altars, holy of holies, bronze bowl, cherubim carvings. It was a beautiful undertaking. But then, 370 years later, the worst of all things. 597 BC, the king of Babylon took over Jerusalem, looted the temple treasures, destroyed the temple all the way into rumble and into ash. And it stayed that way for another 560 years until Herod the Great became king of Israel and construction began and he intended to rebuild this holy center of Hebrew life. But the new temple wasn't going to be modest at all. It was going to be the masterpiece of the ancient world. And by the way, if any of you have had construction projects at home and gotten frustrated that the contractors were taking longer than they told you they would take, this rebuild project took 46 years to get done, but wow. The area of the Temple Mount is doubled, surrounded by a retaining wall with gates. The temple is raised, enlarged, finished with white stone. According to the historian Josephus, the white stones measured 37 
feet wide by 12 feet high. And they built in all kind of little shop areas, kind of like the battery at Truist Park, right? A gathering place with porticos and merchants and money changers, people selling doves and sheep for sacrifice. There was activity and milling all around. And Herod's temple was the center of Israelite life. It wasn't just the focus of religious life. It was the site of the National Library, the judicial system where the Sanhedrin met to hold court. The new temple complex covered 35 acres, stood 150 feet tall, about 10 stories high, absolutely stunning. And the construction ended in the year 4 AD, which means that during the time of Jesus, it still smelled new. Gleaming, towering, busy, massive, commerce, religion, society, learning, all in one big 35-acre mall. And in our story today, Jesus and the disciples were there in the middle of all that hubbub, the coming and going and selling and trading and all of that. They walk out of the temple, and one of the disciples says to Jesus, Look, teacher. What large stones and what, what large buildings. I mean, would you just look at how impressive this is? Ten stories in the air. Those rocks are the size of a hotel room. Would you just look? Jesus says to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Now think about it. They waited five and a half centuries for the new temple, spent 46 years rebuilding it. They just recently had the grand opening. And Jesus said, The whole thing's coming down. A little while later, Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives. He's sitting with four of the disciples. He's with Peter, James, John, and Andrew. They're looking down from the Mount of Olives. They're looking down on the temple and its majesty down below them there. And, And the disciples privately bring up the topic of the earlier discussion Tell us when will this be? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? (laughs) Ah, the signs of the end times. Let me just stop for a minute. This is the part where the people who are fascinated by the apocalypse and rapture and end of times, where those folks just start salivating and stretching chart paper across the Sunday school rooms. Those who just find all kind of happy hunting and the formulas and predictions and apocalyptic speculations as though Jesus had just laid out a puzzle that everybody's supposed to scratch on until they can get it solved. Some of y'all are old enough to remember when uh, folks would come on the AM radio and talk for hours about figuring out the ends of time. Jesus said, many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And they'd go up and plot that. Wasn't there a guy in Waco or something? Jesus said, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. And they'd plot that. Afghanistan and Vietnam. Jesus said, there'll be earthquakes. Okay, I remember earthquakes. They're trying to figure out exactly when all this is happening, this big fascination around the end of times. You know, there's been a whole publishing industry trying to figure out, predict, this isn't the purpose of Jesus. 
Jesus isn't a fortune teller set up with a table at South Beach. Jesus has diagnosed the moral and spiritual health of the people. Jesus isn't setting a date, but declaring the coming conditions of a collapse. Jesus has read the trends and the currents, and he said, all of this is coming down. And they watched from on high, Jesus and his four disciples as the vendors scurried and sold doves and trinkets and souvenirs in the holy place. Every generation, I suppose, has attached some kind of end of world significance to the current events. World War I, they were scurrying around saying the world is at war, that's the biblical stuff, it's going to all come crashing down. Y2K, remember? Everybody was just all in a fear. When that ball dropped in Times Square, everything was just going to shut down. It was all going to be over. So I don't want you to take my words too far. I'm not plotting dates here. I'm not making any wild, wild pronouncements. But the church is in a transition we do not fully understand. And as I said earlier, what do you do when everything you thought was nailed down starts to come unraveled? Global pandemic? Men in Christian t-shirts breaking out windows at the U.S. Capitol. Police in riot gear guarding the streets of major cities. We are inarguably in a major cultural shift. And the American church is in a major shift as well. After 30 years of decline in American mainline Christianity, the pandemic has accelerated a departure from the church. Not, not 550 years after the destruction of Solomon's temple, but 50 years after the greatest generation came home from World War II and built institutions and constructed sanctuaries and filled church pews. We're in a shift. About every three weeks or so, I go to dinner with two of my friends, both in ministry. Sean King, who is pastor of Johns Creek Baptist Church. We all meet at, at near Perimeter Mall. So Sean King drives down from Johns Creek to the Perimeter Mall area. And Greg DeLoach, who's the dean of the McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University, he drives across from Spaghetti Junction over there. I drive from my place up north a little. We converge for dinner and mutual hand-holding and trying to understand and support each other in this unprecedented church era. And a couple of weeks ago, Dr. King offered this observation. I, I, I don't recall if it was his originally or if he was quoting from somebody else, but this is what he said. He said the Jesus movement in Palestine started as an experience of the risen Christ. And then it moved to Greece, to Athens, where it became a philosophy. He said then it moved to Rome, where it became a religion. And then it spread throughout Europe, where it became a culture. I'm French, therefore I'm Christian. He said, then it came to the United States and became a business. And when he said that, I had the image of Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, watching all the buying and selling and politics and merchandise 
consumerism and money changing. And I just wondered. I don't know. I don't know. Some people are saying that America's soon going to look like Europe. Grand cathedrals and nobody in them. One Christian thought leader said we've just entered the Netflix era of church. He said it used to be you had to be at home at 9 o'clock on Thursday night to see your favorite program. Netflix just changed all that. Now you just catch it on your laptop whenever you feel like it. He said that's the new era we're in. Folks who just kind of catch church when they feel like it. Another friend told me recently that he read that 2022 will there will be more pastors leave their churches in 2022 than any year in American church history. Church decline, post-pandemic, a lot of the baby boomers are retirement age. Retirement counts have done pretty good. See ya. I want y'all to hear me say this clearly, and I might have to say it twice. I'm not going to buy into the gloom of these predictions. I'm not buying it. And the reason is not because I'm wearing rose-colored glasses, and it's not because I'm clicking together ruby slippers and just hoping. The reason that I have genuine hope is there is a green shoot peeking out of this passage that gives me a whole different expectation. There's a little phrase right at the end that promises something entirely different. So Jesus is looking down from the Mount of Olives, the busy temple hubbub, the buying and selling, and he says, not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. The disciples say, tell us when. And Jesus says, lots of pains coming first. Wars and nations rising against nations and earthquakes and famines. But then here's the line that burst forth with hope. But this is the beginning of the birth pangs. Jesus has declared that this is the pain that precedes the birth of something. Something new is coming. I know I have no business talking about the intensity of labor pains, but I have experienced the undiluted joy of what happens on the other side. Birth, new life. Easter is preceded by Friday. Great things are always preceded by hard things. See, Solomon's magnificent temple was destroyed in 70 AD and the destruction of that beautiful, glorious temple was painful and horrible and unwelcome and destructive, but it was not the end of God's redemptive work. Jesus was anticipating his own role in God's love project. Resurrection marks a new day in God's redemption. This is not the pain that is associated with death. This is the pain that's associated with labor because new life is coming. This is the beginning of birth pangs, Jesus says. Now we've got to be honest about all the cultural pain and the anxiety of empty church pews, but our hand wringing becomes unfaithful when it becomes despair birth pangs. On the other side of hard times is where new life is to be found. You remember World War II, rations and bloodshed and Hitler. 
And on the other side, men and women came home and bought houses and built churches and pledged devotion and reclaimed labor pains giving way to something new and beautiful and alive. The temple lay in ruins. Sadness, hopelessness. And while the people wept, Jesus pointed down to the river Jordan when Jesus came up from baptism and said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God had something new in mind. Labor pains of destruction giving way to new life. And on a dark Friday, Jesus hung on a cross and his followers watched him take his last breath in agony and it seemed like everything was absolutely hopeless until God raised Jesus up from the dead, new life for all who believe. I have no idea what God is up to right now. I have no idea how this terrible chapter in American history will be redeemed. I do not know how, but I do know who. Because throughout God's redemptive history, God has been transforming hard times into beauty, labor pains producing bouncing new, full of joy life. It is the ongoing pattern of God. This is but the beginning of birth pangs, said Jesus. New life is on the way for those who believe. Rejoicing in that redemption that we enjoy as believers in Christ, let's stand together and sing, redeemed, redeemed, how we love to proclaim it, 575. Let's sing together. things before we go. First, Wednesday night you're going to want to be here. The meal will start about 5.15 but at 6 o'clock we're continuing to focus on ministry partners and how our giving makes a difference. We'll have two guests Wednesday, Jonathan Goode from Orchard 
will tell about uh, the, their ministry and our support. And Jamie Shepherd of the Shepherd Center will be here to talk about their work and our support uh, of the chaplain's office there. Some of you have a whole handful of notes that you wrote last week and this week for college students, and you're wondering, what am I supposed to do with all these notes I wrote for college students? Well, Chelsea Kelly is going to be at the North Bridge to take those off your hands on your way out. Third is a challenge. The challenge is that you would tell one person this week who's not in this room why you believe with optimism a new and good day is coming. Go now, looking everywhere for signs of new life, because that's the nature of God. Go celebrating that God is the author of good times on the other side of hardship. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.